I'm confident that by now few individuals remain unaware of the saga of Cecil the Lion. It has been international news for days. The story being told and retold, the facts as presented often changing. It has sparked discussion about animal rights and welfare, about the very existence of hunting, and especially trophy hunting, and about the relationship of modern humans to wild animals everywhere. It has provoked emotional reactions from both hunting and anti-hunting activists and from the general public. Yet lions are legally hunted in Zimbabwe and other African countries each year. What made the Cecil situation different? Cecil was an impressive and recognizable lion, a favorite of tourists and the subject of many amateur photos and films. However, until his death, he remained virtually unknown to the average Zimbabwean and most of the world. Then on July 1st of this year, this lion was killed. The GPS collar he was wearing was located and retrieved by researchers, and the lion's remains were found outside an adjacent protected area. The story exploded in the international news and spread like wildfire through social media. It was revealed that the lion had been killed by an American dentist who paid approximately $55,000 US to purchase a lion hunt in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean government has formally requested that the American dentist be extradited to Zimbabwe to answer for his alleged crimes of killing a lion in an unauthorized area. PETA, a well-known animal rights organization, spoke out in favor of extradition and called for his hanging. The American public responded to the incident with a petition to the White House containing 100,000 signatures demanding that the American government abide by Zimbabwe's request. Recently, the Zimbabwean landowner, where the line was taken, was charged with allowing an illegal hunt. He has not yet responded with a plea and will return to court on September 18th. The professional hunter associated with Cecil's demise will return to court for trial on September 28th. He has been charged with failing to prevent an illegal hunt. The American dentist has not yet been charged. The hunting industry is believed to contribute over $200 million US annually to African governments to support national parks and wildlife conservation. Further, the authoritative Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna allows for the transport of a select number of trophies from lions hunted legally in Zimbabwe and other African countries each year. CITES issues these permits based on scientific knowledge of the animal population and associated management issues. Thus, lion hunting is a legal activity. But regardless of whether Cecil was hunted legally or illegally, the court of public opinion seems to already have ruled. Celebrities, activists, and average citizens alike have taken to social media. It seems that for the majority of people, the killing of Cecil the lion is considered at best to have been in poor taste, and at worst, to have been an outrageous, intolerable act. Cecil has morphed into so much more than a single lion. He has apparently come to represent all lions and all wild animals everywhere. It was inevitable this conversation would turn to hunting in a wider sense, and not just because of the death of one particular lion. Just a few months ago, the airline industry, based on concerns surrounding the illegal trade in wildlife, including especially elephant ivory and rhino horn, began enacting a ban on shipment of hunting trophies from Africa. Well, this is a completely separate issue. The profile of illicit killing of iconic African wildlife had already sensitized the public mind and the media to some extent. It had also helped contribute to a genuine confusion in the minds of some people regarding the distinction between regulated legal hunting and poaching. Regardless, what the widespread public reaction makes clear is that there now exists a new awareness of hunting, and trophy hunting in particular. It is also clear that there is considerable public concern and opposition to these activities that cannot be identified 
as emanating simply from anti-hunting activists. People everywhere are fascinated and concerned for wildlife. Because of this, and because of Cecil, many members of the general public are trying to understand the relevance of hunting in today's world. For years, wildlife scientists have struggled to publicly communicate the relationship between hunting, wildlife conservation, and land management. It is evident we have not yet been successful in this endeavor, and perhaps failing especially in circumstances where trophy hunting is involved. Yet we know that trophy hunting can be scientifically linked to successful conservation and recovery of wildlife species. A case in point is Pakistan's straight-horned markhor, a bovid mammal closely related to the wild goat. By the mid-1980s, markhor populations were endangered, their fragile numbers occupying a rugged and war-torn mountainous region where poaching was common and wildlife enforcement virtually absent. Then came the Torgar Conservation Project, an initiative launched by local tribal leaders and assisted by international conservation efforts. They used highly restricted and closely monitored trophy hunting to enhance markhor numbers. By employing local people as game guards, they changed public attitudes and provided incentives for enforcement of anti-poaching laws. They demonstrated that wildlife conservation could be an economically viable use of land and that wildlife, harvested sustainably, could be an economic benefit. Local tribesmen accepted a ban on traditional hunting in return for the economic benefits derived from servicing visiting international hunters. Poaching all but disappeared. In June of this year, the Markhor was downlisted from endangered to near threatened, a remarkable recovery that is directly an outcome of regulated legal hunting activity. Recent population estimates are now well past 5,000 individuals. Namibia has its own success stories. It is one of the few countries in the world to specifically address habitat conservation and protection of natural resources in their constitution, Article 95. The Namibian government introduced a community-based natural resource management support structure for communities in the mid-1990s, which helps local people use and benefit from wildlife on their land. Conservancies were created where community members are responsible for protecting their wildlife resources and using them sustainably for ecotourism and trophy hunting opportunities. Profits from conservancies are pooled and used for things like building schools and medical clinics. It may be difficult, of course, for many in the Western public to empathize with the concerns of humans who still live in close proximity to dangerous wild animals. But to fully understand the Cecil situation, it is necessary to do so. Conflicts between humans and wildlife have always existed. In Namibia, humans and elephants often conflict over water supplies and agricultural crops. Namibia is a country prone to drought. An adult male African elephant can weigh up to 15,000 pounds and will consume a bathtub of water every day and consume hundreds of pounds of vegetation. This consumption can be devastating to local communities and thus local Namibian attitudes towards elephants can be very different from those of residents in New York, London or Paris. Ditto for lions. Conversely, an adult male African elephant can provide enough meat to feed whole communities for months at a time. In the past, community members would likely have killed marauding elephants. Now, because of the conservancy programs and the income from trophy hunting, communities have incentives to view elephants differently and are motivated in their conservation. Namibia's communal conservancy program has helped protect and increase, but also sustainably utilize elephants. A recognized conservation success story based, again, upon trophy hunting. Namibia has also had success in recovering the black rhinoceros. Large-scale poaching of black rhino resulted in the population plummeting from 
65,000 individuals in about 1970 to just 2,300 worldwide in 1993. The species had become critically endangered. Following the introduction of the conservancies, Namibia instituted its black rhino conservation strategy. Recognizing both the conservation and community benefits of sustainable hunting, Namibia currently allows for the sale of five hunting permits for non-breeding male black rhino each year. Science has demonstrated that the removal of such specific rhinos can enhance population growth rates and further genetic conservation. The Namibian government requires a significant contribution to a trust fund for any hunting of black rhino, ensuring that revenue comes back to rhino conservation and monitoring. Today, Namibia's black rhino population has more than tripled since the time before the conservancies and their trophy hunting based conservation strategy were established. What these examples demonstrate is that where it is clearly in a community's best economic interest to protect, conserve, and properly manage local wildlife, they will do so, even if the wildlife involved is dangerous and threatening. Furthermore, as poaching undermines the economic welfare of the community as a whole, its members actively work to prevent it. Where such economic incentives are lacking, however, community members move to eliminate dangerous and threatening wildlife using whatever means are at their disposal, including snares and poisons in the case of lions and elephants. Properly regulated, legal, trophy hunting can and does provide such incentives. Whether or not we view this motivation for conservation as morally correct may be a worthwhile debate. But there is no argument that trophy hunting can, when properly managed, be an effective conservation tool even in the case of endangered species. Ecotourism or phototourism are often suggested as economic alternatives to trophy hunting, but it is unrealistic to think they can effectively replace hunting everywhere, though they certainly can be and are effective economic incentives for conservation in their own right. This should not be viewed as an either-or scenario. Areas favorable to ecotourism and phototourism must be reasonably accessible to large numbers of people and boast a high diversity and density of wildlife. That is certainly not true for all of Africa nor for many other parts of the world where people are willing to hunt. The average echo or photo tourist will almost certainly not trek across rugged, dangerous land to wait hours to see a single animal. Yet this is considered a normal part of hunting. Local communities in such areas may simply not have ecotourism opportunities to market. Furthermore, one must consider the relative economic impact of each activity. Certainly, ecotourism may attract far more people. But comparatively, hunters typically spend at least twice as much per individual as ecotourists, and sometimes, indeed often, three and four times as much. While the Cecil phenomenon has engendered an enormous outpouring of public concern and even outrage, it is critical that the entire spectrum of views and evidence are brought to bear. The real issue before us is one of conservation and how we are to safeguard the biodiversity of this planet. No one single effort or approach will be sufficient and we will need every best effort to be successful. As human populations escalate to almost incomprehensible levels in excess of 10 billion, we can only imagine the challenges mankind will face in safeguarding species and the ecosystems they rely upon. There is often a moral challenge in dealing with nature and the environment. Just as many who have expressed outrage over the death of one magnificent African lion will attest, animal health and welfare are important. But so is biodiversity, and so are human livelihoods and well-being as well as human cultures and traditions. How do we choose 
the best path forward to safeguard all of these. The story of Cecil the Lion will fade, though it will not be forgotten soon. This is an opportunity for us to engage in constructive dialogue between all who identify themselves as conservationists. Indeed, for all who care about the future of wildlife. Whether you're a hunter or an activist for animal welfare and protection, you likely share the same ultimate goal for wildlife. If we allow the story of Cecil the Lion to unite rather than divide us, we can hope to achieve this goal. Otherwise, we stand to lose far more than a single lion. We will lose all he represents.